This is your tech news briefing for Tuesday, August 30th. I'm Zoe Thomas for The Wall Street Journal. Compared with storing records in an old filing cabinet, digital storage can feel unlimited. And storing your favorite pictures in the cloud feels more durable than putting them in a photo album. But the hard drives behind digital storage can break. They can experience mechanical failure, or their formats could become obsolete. They can be harmed by dust or heat, or even something computer scientists call bit rot. But the speed at which we're digitizing all sorts of information isn't slowing down. So how can the world keep up? Joining us to discuss that is Dr. Brian Michael Murphy. He's the dean of the college at Bennington College. He wrote about this issue for the Wall Street Journal and in his new book, We the Dead, Preserving Data at the End of the World. Hi, Brian. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. So let's start with some background. Can you lay out kind of how a hard drive works? What's going on inside them? Yeah, so on a hard disk drive, one of the things that's happening is there is a platter where the data is stored, and that platter is spinning very, very, very quickly. And it spins quickly when you write data to it, and it spins very quickly anytime you want to access that data, and the data is going to be read, and then it pops up magically on your computer screen. But mechanically, or I should say physically, what's happening is at a microscopic level, there are little tiny bits of material uh, that the platter is made of, And those little bits, each one of them holds a little tiny piece of information that's either positive or negative. So if you've seen the matrix and you've seen all the ones and zeros going up and down the wall, that's referring to how the computer reads those magnetic charges. And so that's how it's made. And so it has to spin very quickly and it has to spin very, very smoothly for the whole process to work. I mean, that sounds simple enough, but there can be these big problems that run through it, right? I mean, talk us through what some of those are. Yes, some of the problems occur if there's any kind of mechanical failure that goes on with the mechanical parts of the disk. So there are ball bearings in there. Um, Those have to be lubricated. Um, There's a read-write head that can malfunction. If there's any dust, like if there was a problem in manufacturing the disk and there's dust inside and it gets in those components, it can completely ruin everything. Other challenges are the things that have always plagued media going back to ancient times, right? Heat. Even a microscopic form of decay called bit rot, we think that like, oh, paper decays or even film decays, but, you know, even metal uh, decays after a long enough time or it can um, even destabilize a bit to where it loses its magnetic charge. At that point, you've lost the data. What efforts are being made to address those problems? Well, what has driven a lot of the changes in this technology over time is the desire to store more and more data on smaller and smaller spaces. So new data centers are being built all the time. But the problem is the form factor of hard drives and actually the the casing in which they're stored in data centers, that doesn't really change. There's not much flexibility around that. So you've got to figure out ways to increase what's called the aerial density of the hard drive, storing more in the same amount of space. For the past few decades, we've done a very good job of increasing the aerial density of hard disk drives. But those little segments that the platter is divided into, those bits that I mentioned before, they get charged either positive or negative, they're becoming so small that they're unstable. To where if there's any temperature fluctuation, (laughs) the particle can misbehave and actually flip its charge from negative to positive or positive to negative. And that's disastrous for a hard drive because that means that whatever data you wrote into that charge is now lost. So what's happening is uh, they're figuring out ways to create platters out of harder material, but that means you need more energy to actually write the data. So they have like lasers or (laughs) microwave-assisted recording technology. But the main problem is that you can only go so small with those bits and increase the aerial density so far. We've kind of reached that point. So the creativity is still there, but it's really, really hard to innovate beyond that. So how do they get around this hurdle? I mean, are we just up against a wall and we're going to have to start, I don't know, bringing out our filing cabinets and our like cellophane (laughs) photo albums again? Well, um, I'd I'd be all for that because I love filing cabinets and cellophane uh, photo (laughs) albums, but that's more personal preference. I think what's happening is there are a lot of scientists who are trying to think beyond the hard drive. And the next frontier is really DNA data storage. So scientists have figured out how to store the binary code, the ones and zeros, in the proteins of DNA. 
And that is the most dense data storage material that we know of. A few years ago, when a lot of writing was coming out about some of the breakthroughs that happened at Harvard and the University of Washington and Microsoft, they said that the entire internet could be stored in an amount of DNA that would fit inside a shoebox. And of course, DNA is, uh, can be dehydrated or frozen, so it could last for billions of years if you're concerned about permanence. I got to jump in here. Just, you know, DNA, it, it makes people think, what, you're storing this in me, in a, in a human? What kind of DNA are we talking about here? So up to this point, as far as we know, scientists have created synthetic DNA chains in which they have stored data. It can be any kind of data. Just like a computer, you can store something that's text-based or image or video. Um, you can do that in DNA storage. Scientists at Harvard also figured out how to sort of insert data um, <laughs> of a video into a living E. coli organism and were able to actually retrieve the video even after several generations of reproduction in that E. coli strain. So um, there are some other big dreams about sort of DNA-based biorecorders going into people's bodies and things like that. But um, as far as we know, that hasn't happened yet, and it's definitely not at a point where it's scalable. What about manufacturing hard disks up in space? You know, we've talked about that on the show before. We've heard from experts that this is going to be a way to more efficiently create hard drives. Is this something realistically that experts are turning to? Well, it's been a longstanding dream to have a space where you don't have to worry about dust or any other problems arising in the manufacturing. When you're talking about precision manufacturing, you can even go back to the colonial period in America and watchmakers putting their shop three or four stories up so that they were further away from all the dust on the street because dust absolutely ruins fine-tuned mechanical components. So the clean room as a technology is a space where you've eliminated all of that dust. And that's where, you know, microchips and all of these really high-tech components are made. So what's appealing about space, I think, is that there's a dream that space is kind of like the ultimate clean room. I think right now it's a powerful narrative and there is some funding behind it, but I think we're many years off from seeing something like that actually happen. All right, Dr. Brian Michael Murphy from Bennington College, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. And that's it for today's tech news briefing. If you like the show, how about leaving us a five-star rating and telling a friend about it? And if you want more tech news, check out our website, wsj.com. I'm Zoe Thomas for The Wall Street Journal. Thanks for listening.